all sorts of trends are coming together at the same sort of time. Um, but obviously the most immediate upfront one is the question of Trident and whether Trident should be replaced and if so, by what? And I, for one, was slightly concerned that the debate is to be delayed for another five years because I think, frankly, we can have the debate now about what its replacement might be. Uh, a number of us started trying to agitate for the debate about two years ago with letters to the Times. And I was very, that was not only in the context of Trident and what we should do, but in, of course, all the NPT and of the very welcome announcement by President Obama of ultimate zero, which I think is an extremely helpful aim for people to have. We all know that that's not going to happen immediately, but of which we've got something to work towards. And those of us who wrote the letters were keen on three, really, three things, really. First of all, to question whether Trident as such, based on the Moscow targeting criteria, was actually a fit and proper weapon to be in the arsenal of what is now a middle class power as we advance into the 21st century and away from the conditions of the latter part of the 20th century, which demanded weapons of mass destruction, if you like, against mass conventional and other forces. That doesn't happen anymore. And because Trident occupies so much of our budget and it therefore distorts the amount that is available, particularly when the size of the budget is reduced, that is available for other tasks which may be more proper in the national interest. We felt that the whole question of its replacement ought to be challenged now, not least because developments of an alternative do take time, technologically, industrially, everything else. And if you are the possessor of a deterrent, you don't want a gap in it. Now, underneath that all, the alternative that I think we were suggesting, which is not a new one because it's been put forward by several people since the 1980s, was to, yes, maintain a submarine launch deterrent, because that has all the advantages of detection of the submarine and so on, but to move away from the D missile, which you are dependent on the United States because they own it, to a cruise missile alternative because it can be dual capable. You can have both the conventional warheads, which we have used both in Iraq and Afghanistan, and a nuclear warhead. And you don't need all the continuous at sea deterrence posture, which is so hideously expensive. Now, the technology of the cruise missile is improving all the time and there are supersonic versions being developed. So the people who say, oh, well, it's easily detectable and short range and carries a lesser warhead, fine. I don't believe that a larger warhead is actually sensible now anyway. The longer range doesn't actually seem to me quite such a requirement. And also, who is actually going to intercept it? There aren't a great number of people. And so what are you thinking of? What is the purpose of this deterrent? And the third thing we wanted to do was to link it to the whole question of the ultimate zero uh, future to show that, A, we were going along with this by reducing the capability of our deterrent, but we were remaining a member, if you like, of the club during the negotiations so that we wouldn't just suddenly disappear from it and therefore weaken our overall position. And we felt that the time for debate was now but while the decision was being made, hence the launch in the paper. It was a pity that when the Strategic Defence Review came along and everyone was expecting it, and indeed the previous government had published papers about it before they left office, that in fact we were hoping that because the cost of the deterrent is such a destabilising element in a conventional budget, that it would be taken out of the military budget and put into the political budget, somewhere else, foreign office or whatever, because the nuclear deterrent is a political weapon. Its use is only governed by the political, it's not by the military at all. And therefore, if the government feels that it wants it, it should pay for it. But it shouldn't be at the expense of the other weaponry which you need for the defence of the realm, which is its prime responsibility. So. What we felt as we went through this defence review process, that it was a pity really that it appeared to be very treasury driven 
it was the Treasury demanding that this and that should happen. And then, of course, it was the Treasury who announced that the cost of the maintenance of Trident was to be borne by the military budget. Now, our worry about that was that we felt that the time that there was available, there was not time to develop all the arguments about the maintenance of a balanced conventional budget by pointing out all that you would have to give up if you assisted on having Trident. It goes back to the two definitions of affordability. One, can you afford it? Secondly, can you afford to give up what you've got to give up in order to afford it? And our argument was that you could not afford to give up all the other conventional and other weaponry that you needed in order to maintain the defence of the country and carry out your obligations in the early part of the 21st century if your budget was distorted by having to do Trident. Of course, in terms of the budget, you could pay for Trident, but only at the expense of other things. And I feel that actually, although there's been the announcement, the jury is still out and should still be out. But I'm very disappointed that the debate is now to be terminated, as it were, until 2015, rather than continued, and we shall actually be trying to continue it, to make certain that the dialogue doesn't die away. Because, again, time is of the essence, particularly in showing your willingness to go along with all the NPT objectives. The question of dialogue in all this is very interesting because, of course, I mean, when, when I talk to my naval colleagues, particularly those who've got a background in nuclear submarine warfare, which they've taken part in, they, of course, take a very different view. And there are a number of my military colleagues who also take a different view because they are very concerned about the rise of other present in the non-nuclear club. And I think if one homes in on any one country which worries them above anyone else, it's Pakistan. Pakistan because of its very volatile position at the moment, Pakistan because of its relationship with Afghanistan and what we're doing, Pakistan because in its present rather unstable, if not more, failed state status, risks having its nuclear deterrent falling into the hands of people who are not necessarily balanced in their potential use of it or the targeting of it. Yes, people are worried about Iran, but of course I think the worry about Iran is not only what we might do or what they might do, but what Israel might do, which is another fact. And of course there's North Korea. But I think Pakistan is particularly concerning and they do not want to weaken our deterrent posture while there's that uncertainty, particularly when we've got our own armed forces involved in that part of the world. I personally don't go along with that argument. I'm not just saying that I don't worry about Pakistan. I do indeed about Pakistan and India and all that part of the world. But the nuclear deterrent, nu nuclear weapon in it, is one part of the argument. But it doesn't seem to me to be justifying the maintenance of a weapon which is so powerful and unusable as Trident. You cannot envisage a situation where we might use it. The interesting thing though, of course, is, is the dialogue which must be maintained with our American allies on all this, and of course in Europe, particularly with the French. And I welcome us coming closer together on all this. And I think that, that again, the military discussions, I hope it's taking part with place with the Russians and others who are involved in the whole NPT process. I'm not party to that, but I, I do hope it's taking place and the military as well as the politicians taking part in the discussions.